Okay, folks, let's get started. The last week before Thanksgiving week, that's good. The last week before the exam, maybe that's not so good, I don't know. Exam on Friday. Uh, I haven't yet set a review session, but it will almost certainly be on Wednesday, after, uh, when, uh, early Wednesday evening, late Wednesday afternoon. I will let you know um, on Wednesday. We will also have some time in here on Wednesday uh, for uh, in-class review. So uh, I build that in for the second exam so that there's more opportunity for you to ask questions uh, as you need to um, get your questions answered, hopefully. So um, that's uh, important to do. All right. Um, what I'm, uh, the other questions I'm getting a lot of is where does the material for the exam stop? And the material for the exam will stop with the end of today's lecture. Okay. So the material will cover through today's lecture, and then that will be uh, the end of the material for the second exam. OK, uh, well, I want to finish up talking about um, the uh, oxidation, uh, catabolism, anabolism uh, stuff, and then we'll move on and we'll actually start talking about our first metabolic pathway, which is glycolysis that I've made a lot of reference to so far. Last time, um, I pointed out that, uh, of course, cells have to generate energy and store energy and then use that stored energy to build things. And I didn't put some names on there, so I want to put some names on those things. So the process of breaking down larger molecules into smaller molecules has a name. It's called catabolism, C-A-T-A-B-O-L-I-S-M. And the opposite process, that is using energy to make larger molecules, is called anabolism, A-N-A-B-O-L-I-S-M. So catabolism and anabolism. When we talk about metabolism as a, as a process, it consists of catabolism plus anabolism. That's really what metabolism is. So metabolism equals catabolism plus anabolism. Catabolism is generally oxidative. Catabolism is generally energy producing. Anabolism is generally reductive and generally energy requiring. Glycolysis is a catabolic pathway. It breaks down glucose into smaller units. The anabolic pathway that is the opposite of that is called gluconeogenesis, making glucose from smaller molecules. Okay, and we'll talk about both of these um, after uh, the glycolysis today, but both of them um, after the exam uh, on Friday. Okay, so um, glycolysis is, as I said, a catabolic pathway, but it's an unusual catabolic pathway in that it only has one oxidation in it. Only one oxidation in it. We think of glycolysis as being this big um, oxidative pathway for glucose, but most of the oxidation of glucose doesn't happen in glycolysis. It happens later in another pathway called the citric acid cycle. So the one reaction in glycolysis that is, in fact, oxidative is shown on the screen. We'll talk about that later today. Uh, you can tell it's oxidative because we are going from an aldehyde to, in this case, an ester, but the ester arises because we've oxidized the aldehyde to an acid. That's an oxidation step. Biological oxidation, as I finished up last time uh, in talking about oxidation, biological oxidation is different than oxidation that happens in the rest of the world, primarily in the sense that it's much more controlled, as I said. Cells have to do that if you have um, oxidation out of control, you generate too much heat, the cell burns up, the enzymes denature, and that's not a good career move. Oxidation in uh, one of the ways that cells control oxidation inside of them is by using electron carriers. Electron carriers are absolutely essential for cellular oxidation and reduction. Absolutely essential for that. Okay. Now, electron carriers um, are essential, if you th or I shouldn't say essential, but when we think about oxidation, we're th thinking about the loss of electrons. The loss of electrons means those electrons have to go somewhere. They don't just disappear into thin air. Electrons have a tendency not to do that. Okay? 
by transferring the electrons to electron carriers, the uh, reactive nature that they would actually uh, induce in some molecule that gained them very rapidly is reduced. That is, it's lessened. I guess whenever you add electrons, you reduce something, right? So, so what's happening in this oxidation reaction that you see on the screen is electrons from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are being taken and given to NAD. And when they're given to NAD, NAD picks up a proton and becomes NADH. And I find students are often confused by the fact that NAD has a plus sign beside it. NADH does not have a plus sign. So I want to just start by explaining what's going on. If you add up the charges, you add up two electrons, the charge being minus two. The molecule gains a minus two charge, meaning it becomes NAD minus, but then I said it picks up a proton, and when you add a plus to a minus, you get a zero. So NADH has a charge of zero because it has gained one proton and two electrons. Okay. Electrons in general travel in pairs. Uh, as we shall see. Next term, we'll talk about uh, oxidative phosphorylation, where they actually do travel singly for part of it. And, uh, but for the most part, most biological oxidations involve the um, movement of electrons in pairs. I also should point out that <clears throat> NAD is gaining electrons. NAD in this reaction is becoming reduced. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is becoming oxidized. And I've said it before, and I'll say it again, and that is for every oxidation, there is an equal and opposite reduction. So we're seeing the reduction of NAD by the electrons coming from glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is becoming oxidized as a consequence of that. Okay? All right. So that's what's happening there. Um, That's not something we need to worry about at this point. And this is a schematic now showing you a bigger picture of what I described as catabolism. Catabolism, of course, starts with larger molecules. In this case, the larger molecules are fats, polysaccharides, uh, and proteins. And they get broken down into smaller molecules, which include fatty acids, glycerol, glucose, and other sugars, amino acids, etc. We could also put up here nucleic acids. Okay, DNA and RNA are large polymers, and when we break them down, we make nucleotides or deoxyribonucleotides, depending upon whether we're talking about RNA or DNA. And yes, they do get broken down inside of cells. Okay? Um, so in going from the top to the bottom, we're going from larger molecules to the sm smaller molecules, and ultimately, we're going to controlled oxidation uh, that's going on at the very bottom. The oxidation that goes on at the very bottom occurs uh, in our cells and in uh, all anaerobic, I'm sorry, all aerobic cells in the mitochondria. And the mitochondria is a very specialized organelle designed, A, to oxidize things, and B, to harvest that energy uh, very, very efficiently. Okay. Here are some electron carriers. No, you won't have to know their structure, but you should know they're oxidized and reduced forms, at least in terms of their names. So I've already said that NAD plus is the oxidized form of NAD. NADH is the reduced form, meaning it has gained electrons and a proton. There are other electron carriers besides NAD. Another one uh, includes FAD. And FAD looks like this guy right here. Okay. When FAD is reduced, it becomes FADH2. So FAD has no charge, FADH2 has no charge, and I figure you guys can probably figure out the math to see why FADH2 doesn't have a charge. Okay. Um, redox reactions in general uh, are changing oxidative states of things, as I showed you before with the glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We see a molecule going from one oxidative state to another. If you looked at that state of carbon that I showed you earlier, going from an alcohol to in this case, a ketone uh, is an oxidation. So this molecule is becoming oxidized. This NAD is becoming reduced. Okay. On this side, we have the oxidized form. On this side, we have the reduced form of NADH. Over here, we have the reduced form of the molecule and the oxidized form uh, of NAD. Okay. 
And just to show you, again, you don't need to know the structures here, but just to show you, these are the oxidized form and the reduced form of FAD. The main difference being that you're getting protons and electrons that are coming in uh, and converting this two double bonds into one double bond in addition to adding those two hydrogens that are there. Some enzymes are set up to use FAD compared to NAD, and we'll talk about those. And there are uh, people wonder why. Is it just uh, an arbitrary thing? And it's not really an arbitrary thing. It's actually rooted in the chemistry. There's more energy considerations. We'll talk about that next term with respect to different oxidations. So some things will generate more uh, energy by oxidation than other things will, and uh, we'll see how the electron carriers uh, are considerations for that. There's an FAD reaction, and this is a very common FAD reaction where we see a single bond being converted into a double bond. That means loss of electrons by between these two carbons. The electrons are going to FAD uh, along with two hydrogens to make FADH2. Okay, and let's see. I will just show you um, these guys here. Uh, we'll talk about them more um, actually next term, uh, more so than this term. But this is a molecule that you probably heard a lot about. It's known as acetyl-CoA. And it's comprised of several individual things, the most important end of it being out here, this sulfhydryl at the end, because it's this sulfhydryl that actually carries the thing that's being carried. And I, and I, I, should, I said acetyl-CoA. I, I apologize. I, that's not acetyl-CoA. That's coenzyme A, CoA. So if we had acetyl-CoA, we, we would be putting an acetyl group onto that sulfur right there. The addition of an acetyl group to that sulfur creates a very high energy bond. And in that sense, we can think of acetyl-CoA as an activated intermediate, very much like we talked about UDP glucose earlier being an activated intermediate. Acetyl-CoA is also one. OK, the last thing, I'm going to skip over the vitamins because I don't think those are essential for our purposes here. But the last thing I want to talk about are different reaction types. Different reaction types are important because um, when we look at all the reactions, all the chemical reactions that occur inside of living organisms, it turns out we can group them into six different groups. Okay? A wide variety of reactions, but the commonalities among them are that there's only six very uh, fundamental type of chemical reactions that are occurring in cells. One of those you've already seen and I've been talking about, and that's known as oxidation-reduction. Oxidation-reduction um, reactions are very easy to spot because they always involve an electron carrier, FAD in this case, NAD in this case, and yes, there are other ones in some cases as well. Okay? But they always involve an electron carrier. The six different uh, reaction types give rise to a systematic way of naming enzymes. In fact, I say naming, it's actually numbering of enzymes. So enzymes um, are grouped into six categories depending upon which of the six types of reactions that they catalyze. Those six categories are known as EC types. And EC stands for enzyme commission, which, decided, which decides which category an enzyme fits into. So oxidation reduction is, is the first type. And again, you don't need to know which number they correspond to. But you should know the basic uh, reaction types. Second type of reaction is a fairly straightforward one. They're known as ligation reactions. Ligation reactions are reactions in which we're ligating or sticking two things together. In this case, we're taking pyruvate and sticking it to uh, carbon dioxide to make this four carbon molecule called oxaloacetate. We have ligated them together. So ligases are enzymes that ligate or link two things together to make one. The third uh, enzymatic type are those of isomerization reactions. And these are pretty straightforward. Isomerization, of course, involves changing stereoisomers in some way or rearranging a molecule in some way. And um, an example we'll talk about next term is the conversion of citrate to isocitrate. You can see what's happening in this isomerization that this OH group and this hydrogen are, being, are having their places swapped. The molecule is being rearranged. It's being isomerized. So isomerization reactions are a third type of enzymatic uh, reaction. Fourth type is a group transfer. And a group transfer uh, occurs when a part of one molecule is transferred to another molecule. 
So I've talked about this reaction already. This reaction is the first step of glycolysis. It's catalyzed by the enzyme hexokinase. And in this reaction, a phosphate from ATP is being moved from ATP over onto glucose to make glucose 6-phosphate. So this group, in this case the group is a phosphate, has been transferred from one molecule to another molecule. The fifth type of reaction is a hydrolytic reaction. And hydrolytic reactions uh, generally involve water. They don't absolutely have to, despite their name. But they involve using a molecule like water to split something. Okay, you've seen these already when you saw chymotrypsin, for example, which cleaved peptide bonds. And if you remember what the peptide bonds required, they required water in order for that to happen. Okay? So hydrolysis or hydrolytic reactions uh, involve water, and they use that molecule to break bonds. The last one is probably the hardest to understand, and to be honest, I'm not going to hold you very responsible for it, but I will describe it to you. They're called liases. And liases can be thought of simply as breaking things apart. In a very simple way, that's what they do. And it's a bit more complicated than that. But I think if you know that liases catalyze the breakage apart of bigger molecules into smaller ones, uh, you'll be in good shape. This liase uh, is uh, a very Im important uh, uh, um, reaction that's catalyzed inside of a glycolysis. We'll talk about that later today. But you can see a six carbon molecule is being broken down into two three carbon molecules. Okay, that is the last thing I want to say that, uh, about that. I want to point out one interesting thing to you, and that is uh, something that probably uh, you never thought of before because we probably haven't, you haven't talked about it. And I know a lot of biochemists themselves aren't even aware of it. But that is if we look at a wide variety of molecules, there's coenzyme A that I've talked about, there's NADH, there's FAD, and there's ATP. All of them have the same building block of ADP. Every one of them has ADP. If you can see the ADP in blue, red, yellow, blue, red, yellow, blue, that should be red, yellow, and blue, red, yellow there. ADP is uh, the fundamental um, uh, component that's common to each of those, and that's uh, something about the ubiquitousness uh, of ADP and ATP in our cells. Okay, uh, if there are no questions on that, I'll move on to glycolysis, or if you have questions, I'll take those now. Yes? No, his question is, are there, are there other electron carriers besides NAD and FAD? And yes, there are. Uh, they're not common. The ones that you're responsible for are NAD and FAD. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Is there a name for enzyme that causes isomerases? Yeah, isomerases. That, that's one of the categories. Yeah. Question? Robin? Okay, so our question is, serine proteases and cysteine proteases use either alkoxide or sulfoxide ions in part of their catalysis. They're not really, hyd they're not really hydro hydrolases, are they? Yes, they are, because the first step involves the alkoxide ion, but the second step involves the use of water to release that uh, covalent intermediate. So that's how the water gets into there, and that's why the water is required. So yes, they are hydrolysis uh, enzymes because they do require water to ultimately break the bond. The, the, and it's, it's a little confusing because the actual bond breakage is, is done by the alkoxide ion, you're right. But without water, we're stuck with enzymes, enzyme covalently attached to peptide, and we can't have that. So water is necessary to release that. Okay? Okay. Well, let's turn our attention to glycolysis. And I, I find that students um, um, relate to glycolysis because it can, relates to an awful lot to things that happen uh, inside of their own bodies. And um, the first part of it is, I will say, not the most exciting. That's the part we're going to deal with right now, which is the reactions of glycolysis. I'll try to spice it up. I won't sing. I won't dance. Uh, we may have a song on Wednesday, but uh, not today. Um, glycolysis is, um, again, as its name implies, glycolysis, glyco referring to sugar, lysis referring to breaking down. So glycolysis means the breaking down of sugar. Glycolysis is uh, typically the first place that students learn about metabolism because it is um, 
common to virtually every cell on the face of the earth. There are some rare exceptions where they may be missing one or two enzymes of glycolysis, but essentially every cell on the face of the earth um, does, goes through glycolysis. When we look at glycolysis, uh, we see that glucose becomes converted to pyruvate. That's 10 steps getting to here, and as I mentioned last time, there's different fates that pyruvate have depending upon conditions. One of those fates involves making of ethanol, which is how we get beer and wine and all kinds of goodies like that. And they don't happen in our cells. They actually happen in bacterial and yeast cells, and we'll talk about that uh, later. There's the 10 steps of glycolysis. And yeah, that's a tiny figure. And yeah, you're probably not going to necessarily see all that as uh, closely as you would like to. And I'm going to show you close-ups of the individual reactions. But I'd like to just show you this figure to give you uh, an overview of the process. The overview of glycolysis is that um, it can be basically broken up into about three different um, segments. The first segment uh, is shown up here uh, on the top part. It's called the energy investment phase. Okay? So the energy investment phase is when ATP is actually needed to start the process. So you have to prime the pump, as it were. You have to start glycolysis with ATP. The second phase is the um, uh, conversion phase. And there's a, a variety of names that different people give to it. The conversion phase simply uh, involves going from a six carbon intermediate into two three carbon intermediates. And we'll see how that goes. And the last phase of glycolysis is the energy realization phase. And this is where ATP is made um, during uh, the overall process. Okay. All right. So that's the overview of glycolysis. As I said, there's only one oxidation that occurs in the, over, in the entire pathway. That reaction is shown right here. You can see NAD going to NADH. And there's no other place on the entire pathway that you see uh, an electron carrier uh, being involved. So that's the only oxidation that's happening in glycolysis. Well, let's take a look at that energy uh, investment phase. Generally, uh, it involves uh, this top part in which glucose is being converted into a molecule called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We'll see this is a multi-step process. And if we look at the individual reactions for that process, we see, first of all, that here's this reaction I've shown you previously. You've seen this one before, and that is uh, hexokinase catalyzes this first reaction. By the way, I get questions, well, what do we need to know about this? Do we need to know all the structures? Do we need to know all the enzymes? Blah, blah, blah. And the answer is that I think you should know the names of the enzymes. And I think you should know the structure of any intermediates that we've talked about. So glucose is fair game, which means that glucose 6-phosphate is fair game, because glucose 6-phosphate simply means you're putting a phosphate on position 6 of glucose. We'll see fructose popping up. And I've asked you to know fructose before. And therefore, you should know the structure of fructose, 6-phosphate, uh, six, six fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, because they're just putting phosphates onto the appropriate places. Okay. Anything else in terms of structures that I expect you to know, I will tell you as we go along. Okay. You should know, and I'll, actually, I'll, as I'm thinking about it, I'll just say it right here. I will be talking about energy of, of individual reactions. You should know the intermediates, the names of the intermediates, involved in any of the reactions that have very negative delta G0 primes or very positive delta G0 primes. You don't need to know the value of the delta G0 primes, but you need to know which reactions and the intermediates in those reactions that have very negative or very positive delta G0 primes. Well, this is one of those reactions. This reaction has a fairly negative delta G0 prime value. And you remember that when you have a fairly negative delta G0 prime value, that means that if we start out with equal concentrations of products and reactants, that the reaction will go forwards. It will be driven fairly strongly forwards by that fairly negative delta G0 prime value. Okay? The reason that this reaction is fairly favorable is because that uh, ATP is a coupled intermediate in this reaction. The hydrolysis of ATP is coupled to the movement of that phosphate onto glucose and makes this reaction be energetically favorable. 
I mentioned last time, or maybe lecture before last, that if we try the same reaction with just phosphate, we can actually make it go, but not very well. Okay? If we start with equal concentrations of everything here, and we just put phosphate in instead of ATP, what happens is the reaction will actually go backwards. So we don't see it going to any significant extent without that ATP. That tells us that the energy from ATP is necessary to drive this reaction forwards. Okay, so that's the first reaction in the process of glycolysis. This reaction, oh, I should also point out one of the, and actually I won't, I'll, I'll talk about this later. Okay. Um, uh, hexokinase, you may recall, was the enzyme that I said had these jaws that sort of came together and it uh, changed its shape upon binding of the substrates. And um, the change in shape that happens is uh, a very good example of induced fit. The, remember that the induced fit model of catalysis says that the enzyme changes the substrate, but so too does the substrate transiently change the shape of the enzyme upon binding of that. And that's what's happening in this uh, movement. You can see what happens uh, with the binding uh, is that the, the, the blue structure is becoming the red one. We see this, this literally this lid clamping down. Uh, that's the movement downwards that's being shown here. And uh, the enzyme um, uh, has activity as a result of that change in movement. Okay. The second reaction of glycolysis um, is um, catalyzed by an enzyme called phosphoglucoisomerase. Phosphoglucoisomerase. And phosphoglucoisomerase catalyzes this uh, change right here, going from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Notice that it goes from ring to straight and then back to ring to, in order to do this. And this is a very simple reaction. The only thing that's really happening here is we're, we're converting an aldo group to a keto group. We're moving that double bond O down. All right? So we're changing the position of the double bond O, and that's really all that's happening in this reaction. Phosphoglucoisomerase is the enzyme. This uh, reaction is energetically pretty neutral. It has a delta G0 prime pretty close to zero pretty close to zero, meaning that if we start with equal concentrations of products and reactants, we don't see really much change uh, over time with that. The product of this, fructose 6-phosphate, of course becomes the substrate for the next enzyme, and the next enzyme you're going to see over the next couple of lectures is one of the most interesting enzymes um, in all of glycolysis. That reaction is shown here. The enzyme is called phosphofructokinase, and the abbreviation uh, for this enzyme is one that you can use. It's called PFK. PFK. So PFK catalyzes this reaction. It's a reaction that's not unlike the reaction we saw for hexokinase. Okay? This is a kinase reaction, meaning that, an, that uh, phosphate is being put onto something. The phosphate is being put onto F6P, which is fructose 6-phosphate. Yes, you can use F6P. In general, you can use all of the abbreviations for all the intermediates that I use. And there's one I'll show you the book uses that I don't like, and I'll tell you not to use that one, but that one is down the line. This reaction, uh, phosphate from ATP, is being put onto position number one to make fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, or F1,6-BP. This enzyme, this reaction is also energetically very favorable. Again, because that ATP is involved in that coupled reaction that is driving this, this reaction forwards. I'll slow down and let you guys catch up with your writing. Everybody's looking a little tired. You getting tired? I wish I had a joke. I don't have a joke for it. Yes. So this, this, this reaction is energetically very favorable, meaning it has a delta G0 prime that's ne fairly negative. Now, there's several reasons why this enzyme is of interest. We'll see uh, later, which will happen next week when I talk about regulation of glycolysis, that this enzyme has a very interesting regulation. Um, and regulation, of course, is how the enzyme is controlled. And the things that control this enzyme 
are very interesting things in the cell. Um, and it's an unusual regulation because, you know, we've talked uh, so far about feedback inhibition. And feedback inhibition, we think of the first enzyme in the pathway. And here we are already in the third enzyme in the pathway. And this is one of the primary regulatory steps in the entire process. There's a reason why, okay? Uh, but it's, it's, it's an unusual metabolic pathway in having that enzyme uh, be further along in the pathway before it's actually a, a regulated one. Okay, questions about that? All right, so at that point, we've finished the energy investment phase. So far, we've used two ATPs. We put a phosphate on position one, and we put a phosphate on position six, not in that order, of course, um, yielding the product fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. In the next step of the, of the pathway, something interesting happens, and it's uh, a little unusual. This reaction is actually the lyase step. It's catalyzed by an enzyme called aldolase. And aldolase takes fructose 1,6-bisphosphate and splits it into two molecules. These two molecules, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, which is called DHAP, and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, and this is where I don't like this abbreviation at all, I call this G3P. Glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate is G3P. Okay. Gap, I just never have been fond of that. Okay. I don't shop at the Gap either, so I guess that probably really makes sense, right? All right. Now, why is this, this reaction of interest? This reaction is of interest because it has a very positive delta G0 prime. A very positive delta G0 prime. Now, based on what I've told you about delta G0 primes, and based on the delta G equation, it may seem a little surprising that we've got a metabolic reaction that has a fairly positive delta G0 prime. What does that mean for the cell with respect to making this reaction go forwards? What's it going to have to do? Uh, put in energy, but as you can see, there's no energy in this reaction. So, it does, so energy is not an option. Laurie? So if it has a lot of reactants, then the, this is going to make the ratio of products to reactants smaller. There's something else that the cell can do to make this reaction go forwards. Remove the products. So by removing the products and increasing the reactants, the delta G for this equation, for this reaction can be made negative. Now, we'll see later uh, when I talk about regulation. I'm not going to talk about it here. But when I talk later about regulation, we'll see that, that this molecule right here, F16BP, not surprisingly accumulates. And when it accumulates, it turns on an enzyme that ends up helping to remove products. And that's kind of a cool thing. I will define a, a term for you here that you should be, or two terms here that you should be aware of. And I use these terms a lot in talking about this reaction. The terms are pushing and pulling of reactions. Pushing and pulling. This reaction involves both pushing and pulling. If you have a car that's stuck in the middle of the street, you can push the car and maybe get it to move. But if you have a friend that has a car with a chain on it that can pull it from the front, the com combination of pushing and pulling it make it a lot easier to move, right? Same thing happens with these reactions. Well, what is pushing? Pushing, by my definition, involves what Laurie described, which is the increasing the concentration of reactants. Something is pushing it along. The reactants are starting to accumulate. Pulling, by contrast, involves removal of products. You're pulling it by taking things away from it. Pushing and pulling allow cells to get over energy barriers sometimes. And this is one of those places where that energy barrier is overcome and needs to be overcome. Okay? Make sense? Okay. The next step in the process is a simplification uh, for students. We don't always get simplifications, but this one is a simplification. Remember in the last reaction, we made dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. This next 
uh, reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called triose phosphate isomerase, or TPI. This reaction involves the conversion of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So at this point, we have two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates. And all the subsequent reactions will occur on identical molecules. So you don't have to remember one set for this and one set for this. This enzyme, you may remember, or maybe you may not remember, is one I described as a perfect enzyme. This enzyme has evolved as far as it can get, meaning that additional evolution, evolutionary changes involving mutation, will make it be less efficient. It will not have that same high Kcat over Km ratio that we talked about. And the reason, there's a very important reason that this cell has, uh, I'm sorry, that this enzyme is perfect in virtually all cells. The reason that this enzyme is perfect is because there's an intermediate in this reaction that's very unstable. By making the reaction go as fast as it possibly can, leaves less time for the unstable intermediate to fall apart and go into something else and cause problems. So the strategy of the enzyme to, be, to catalyze this reaction as rapidly as it possibly can is to stop the, the unstable intermediate from having a chance to fall apart and become something else. So it's a control issue. The enzyme is controlling the production of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate okay, because in the process of, of getting there, there's an unstable intermediate that could be a problem if it was allowed to sit around. Yes, question. So, I think you might have mentioned this, but this is separate from the conversion of glucose 1,6 phosphate to DHAT and PPE. Right. So, in the, in the previous reaction, in the aldolase reaction, we made one molecule of dihydroxyacetone phosphate, and we, had, we made one molecule of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. In this reaction, we're converting that one molecule of dihydroxyacetone phosphate into glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. So now we have two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. Is the, is the DHAP the unstable intermediate? No, there's, a, there's an intermediate in between these two. Yeah. Yes, Laurie? Yeah, would that reaction go forward on its own uh, with the unstable intermediate? And, the, re and the, the answer is, A, it would probably go fairly slowly, as most non-enzymatically catalyzed reactions uh, would go. But the chemical intermediate probably would prevent it from actually getting to this uh, step at all. So I would say the likelihood it would go on its own would not be significant in the cell at all. So the enzyme makes it possible that the speed up, but then the great speed up to prevent the unstable uh, intermediate from... from, from um, Accumulating. Okay. Okay. There's the triose phosphate isomerase, blah, blah. There is the mechanism uh, that it uses. There's the unstable intermediate right there. And this unstable intermediate is very rapidly converted so that the cell ultimately ends up making this. Uh, and has, this has very little chance to sit around and fall apart, basically. And there it is again. You don't even know the structure. But this unstable intermediate makes methylglyoxal, which is not something that cells want to have laying around. It doesn't have any way of, the cells don't have any way of metabolizing that molecule. Okay. Well, now we've completed stage two. And we will complete stage three. Stage three is when energy is generated. In the energy generation phase, now we're going to have an oxidation step, and we're going to have some other steps that help to produce ATP. From this point forward, we have two identical molecules of everything. So we're starting with two identical molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We add two molecules of NAD, and we're going to make two molecules of this guy and two molecules of NADH. Now, Look at this reaction. We're going from an aldehyde to an acid. Notice what we're doing. We're putting a phosphate on this guy. Remember I said if we start with glucose and we try to add a phosphate to it to make glucose 6-phosphate, I say we have a reaction that's energetically unfavorable. We had to use ATP in order to make that reaction occur, right? 
Here, I'm showing you a reaction where we're adding phosphate to something, but you don't see any ATP. Why? Why doesn't this require ATP to go forwards? What's the difference? You're a tired group today, aren't you? Yes, sir. Well, it has the phosphate, but I don't know how it got the phosphate. Okay, that's what I'm asking you, sir. It's just, he says it has a phosphate, but I don't know how it got the phosphate. I said, well, okay. There is um, you know, something important that's happening here that allows that phosphate to be put on there without ATP. Yes, sir? Uh, does the NAD plus um, move to electron contention from the G3C binding the organic phosphate group? Okay, so why, would the, why do you think that would allow the phosphate to go? You're on the right track. Well, it's not, it's not a charge-based thing, no. But, but you're on the right track. Okay, so the answer is the oxidation. Remember, oxidation, oxidative reactions generate energy. In the ATP case, ATP was supplying the energy. We have, the, have in this case, oxidation going on. And oxidation is providing the energy necessary to put that phosphate on there. This is a fairly energetically favorable reaction. Interestingly, in the process of putting this phosphate on there, a very high energy intermediate is also being created. A very high energy intermediate is also being created. 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate is one of those molecules I showed you earlier in the term that has more energy than ATP does. It has more energy than ATP does. Creatine phosphate was one that you saw had more energy than ATP. And how do we make creatine phosphate? Do we have an oxidation? No. What do we do to make creatine phosphate using ATP? Concentration of products, I'm sorry, concentration of reactants that drove that reaction forwards, right? In this case, we don't need to alter concentrations. We've got an energy source, the energy source being the oxidation that's driving this addition of this phosphate. So fundamentally different thing that's going on here compared to uh, another uh, reaction. This enzyme name, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase, whenever you see dehydrogenase, that should always tell you that you have an oxidation, rea oxidation reduction reaction going on. Some of my students say, well, why don't we call this a kinase? A phosphate is getting put on. And in fact, a phosphate is being put on. It is a sort of a kinase reaction, but we don't call it a kinase because the main thing, the, the main reason that the phosphate is going on is because of the oxidation reduction. The main reaction that's occurring here is oxidation reduction. Okay. One more reaction, and then I will actually call it a day. How about that? We'll, we'll finish early. Okay. You've got to quit trying to put your papers away. Otherwise, I will just continue talking. Okay, we'll have all the way up till the end. We won't have the shuffling of paper. How's that? All right. So, um, that is a re repetition of what I just showed you. That's not what I want. Okay. Uh, reaction seven. Okay. This uh, reaction is. Uh, the uh, reaction or the first reaction of glycolysis where ATP is actually being made. Notice we're starting with ADP and we're producing ATP. There's a phosphate that's coming from 1,3-BPG to make 3-phosphoglycerate. So basically this phosphate from position 1 is being transferred onto ADP to make ATP. This reaction is energetically um, reasonably favorable. It's not overly negative or positive. Okay? But the important thing here is that um, ATP is being created, and it's being created because there's a very high energy intermediate. 1,3-BPG has a lot of energy. It makes it fairly easy for it to transfer its phosphate over to ADP to make ATP. This enzyme is called phosphoglycerate kinase, and we call it a kinase because, again, the primary thing that's happening here 
is a transfer of phosphate going from one molecule to the other molecule. Okay, I am feeling sorry for you, so I will stop there. Material for the second exam will also stop there. On uh, Wednesday, I will talk a little bit, probably finish up glycolysis, and the rest of the period will be, avail will be a review session for, uh, for questions from you, and then I'll have a, a review session later in the afternoon on Wednesday as well. Yes, sir. The fate of the hydrogen? Um, that's a good question. That hydrogen. You know, I don't remember. Okay. I don't remember. Um, I think. Hey, I'm I, I, not sure. I'm not sure. That's wrong. <laughs> Probably is wrong. I'd have to look it up. I don't remember. Uh, sorry. Yeah. <clears throat> Yes. I had a question about a class for next term. Yeah, molecular um, medicine. My, I was wondering if it'll be if it's big enough to wait till phase two to register, or if I should register for it now if it'll be full. It's hard to say. It doesn't always fill up, but it gets close. Okay. So that's my my thought. Yeah. Okay. I had last. I, I don't think I've ever had to lock people out. So oh, here, here you go. That's. It works beautifully today. Very nice. So, really? Why? For one, I don't know what's wrong. It'll probably screw up for you. Okay. Pretty much all you need is a letter from my coach. Yeah. And then, then we'll talk about it. Okay. okay. Oh, how are you doing? Uh, I will get you that letter oh, okay. to you on Wednesday. Thank you, Sandra. So. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Good. Good. How's it going? Good. This is a true test of my memorization skills. Yeah, yeah, a lot of stuff there, huh? Yeah, it'll, you'll see that when you, when you start laying it out yourself with glycolysis, because it's sequential, once you know one, you know the next step, you know that one, then you know, and, 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 and there is a sequential.